church today? Amen. Now listen. The Holy Spirit is, is that thing that inside you that is just like, man, that is good singing right there. And if you didn't have that through the song, I'd get saved. Because someday he is going to come back. And you're not going to see him, but we're going to see him as he is. You're going to miss it. You come back tonight, we're going to talk about the moment that he comes back. It is so fast and so quick that you're not going to be a part of it if you're not saved. Boy, that was good. Man, they did a good job. My word. And I love that song. I didn't know they were even singing that this morning. And, uh, and I'm glad I didn't know that. All right, you got to go to, now we got to get to preaching. My soul, I got like five minutes to preach. Amen. And you don't have any idea. Listen, Sunday morning, Sunday night of last week, I have just as many notes for this message of Sunday morning and Sunday night's message. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to really preach fast. 1 Corinthians 15, stand up. 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read our verse together because we want to we wanna do that. And I'm on now, brother. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, let's read verse number 20 together. I'll get you started, and then I'll drop out. Ready, begin. But now... Boy, that's a great verse. I was looking at it yesterday. We're going to touch on it just briefly tonight on the word first fruits. And uh, you got to understand. You understand? You know, what's, you know what takes place on Tuesday, right? You know what Tuesday is? It's Passover. Tuesday starts Passover, a uh, great, uh, great high holy feast day for the Jews. Matter of fact, the highest and holy uh, feast day that the Jews have is Passover. Passover speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he was going to make. And uh, I'll just give you a little primer to it. Christ died on Passover while they were killing the sacrificial lamb. At the exact moment that they were slicing the neck of the sacrificial lamb, slitting its neck and draining the blood, the Lord Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, shedding his life's blood. It is absolutely perfectly lined up. First fruits is another one of the feasts, and it goes right along with this. That's why it's very key and crucial in the Word of God. You're going to have to come tonight to hear the rest of it. Go with me uh, to verse number 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. Man, I'm so charged up, I'm probably talking 100 miles an hour right now. That's all right. I needed that song this morning, I promise. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scripture. We have, over the past several weeks, we looked at, the first word was Christ. The second word was crucified. Last week, we looked at the word concealment. Uh, and this week, we're going to look at concealment, but we're going to look at concealment and the cemetery concealment, and the cemetery. Say It's still one word. Uh, we're just kind of uh, adding a little bit to it. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, Lord, I thank you for the service thus far. And I thank you for those young men. Lord, they did a wonderful job singing the song unto thee. And uh, my heart was lifted into the heavenlies. Lord, it was, almost, it was almost like the moment was about to take place and you were going to come back. And you could do that. If that would be your desire before this service is over, Lord, I don't need to preach, but what I would be great just to see you be in heaven, be reunited with friends and family members that have gone on ahead to see our Savior. Oh, you're so good to us. Lord, you've saved us. And then you're going to come back for us and we get to spend an eternity with you. Man, oh man, and it's going to be like that every day in heaven, I think. I can't wait for that time. But we're here now and we need your help. And I need your help. Lord, please clear my mind in this room of distracting things. Help us to focus and key in on the Word of God. We love you. We need thy presence to be experienced in this place. We ask all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. And amen and amen. You may be seated. Concealment. Last week, we picked up the reading and we went through the Gospels. We're going to do the same thing again, so have your thumbs ready. Uh, and I may just turn to some of them just to uh, get there and to read some of it. But we looked at the Lord Jesus Christ as he died on the cross. 
and everything has, is done now. He has died, and he's hanging on the cross, all right? He's still there. We haven't quite got him down off of the cross yet, but we're working on that. We're going to get that to that point today. Uh, it's about, uh, you got to keep it, this in mind, it's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and sunset is about to come. That's why it's important to know that what was coming was Passover feast was about to begin, and there had to be some preparation. This was the day of preparation was the day that Christ died. So they're getting ready to go into a high holy day, being that Passover day. Uh, and so Christ is on the cross. It's about 3 o'clock. We saw two characters come out of the shadows. We saw Joseph of Arimathea, the secret disciple, and then we saw Nicodemus, the suspected disciple. Joseph of Arimathea, the Bible says, uh, for fear of the Jews, had kept his discipleship uh, a secret, had kept the fact that he had trusted Christ a secret from everybody. And then Nicodemus is the one that the Bible says three times, Nicodemus, the one that came to Jesus by night. They've both been secret disciples of Christ, but now they've come to the point where they've had to come out of the shadows because everybody has left Christ on the cross. Uh, the family's gone away. His friends have gone away. The disciples have gone away. Everybody's gone. Christ is on the cross, and somebody's got to get him down. And so that's where we come. We fast forward into the story, and, and we get to Joseph, and we get to Nicodemus. Joseph goes to Pilate, and he, he begs. That's where we left off on Sunday night. He begs. The Bible uses the word beg. He uses the word crave. He begs the body of Christ. He goes before uh, this great and powerful man, and he says, I need to get Christ down off the cross. Can I have his body? Can I take that? All right, and so let's kind of pick up at that point if we can. We're looking at the word courage, the courage that it took for Joseph and for Nicodemus. We saw the plea uh, on Sunday night. We saw the speediness of the plea. The, it, the, we saw the spirit of the plea. What was the spirit of the plea? First of all, it was a fearless plea, and then it was a fervent plea in the word bagged or the word craved. The other word is the word besought. Those all three words used in the Gospels that have to do with uh, Joseph asking Pilate for the body of Christ. So uh, as we look at the speediness and as we look at the spirit, let's look at the next thing there. I want you to see the surprise. The surprise. Go to Mark chapter number 15. Mark chapter number 15. And let's look at the surprise while you're turning there. Uh, and we're going to stay in the Gospels. And I am going to preach fast because I've got three pages of notes, and some of this I'm just going to give to you because I want us to get to the end, uh, and, and there's some important things here. But please, try to digest some of what's going on here because every bit of it uh, is going to point to the same thing. All right, here, look at the surprise in Mark chapter 15, verse number 40, 44. And Pilate marveled if he were already dead. And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had uh, been any while dead. Now that's kind of a confusing way to put it. But basically, Pilate, uh, I want you to see two things about the surprise. Remember that Christ has only been on the cross for six hours. Are you with me? Am I too fast this morning? Have I taken too much speed before church? I drank three monsters and had a five-hour energy extra and two cups of coffee. Amen. I'm liable to have my heart explode this morning before the service is over. Uh, all right? He's been on the cross for six hours. They put him on the cross at 9 o'clock, okay? He has been on the cross, remember, from 9 until noon, uh, he has suffered on the cross. From noon until 3 o'clock, there has been darkness. It's only been six hours, and Christ uh, is now dead. We know that because the Bible says that. But here's what we get. And now you're going you're gonna to watch that most of the truths that I give you this morning concerning this time frame here have one central theme. There's one person in control, and it ain't Pilate. It ain't Joe. It ain't Nick. It ain't any Roman guards. There's one person in control of the crucifixion, and his name is God. And you go to John chapter number 10, and you look at verses 17 and verse number 18, and Christ himself said, I have the power to lay my life down, right? Did he say that, Brother Aaron? He said, and then I have the power to take it up again. He's the one that is orchestrating and ordering everything that's taking place on the cross. Man was just used by God to fulfill redemption 
but God was the one that was doing all the work. Let's not get confused about, well, man wasn't, man wasn't in charge of nothing. God went to the, Jesus Christ went to the cross, Brother Caston, exactly on the day, exactly at the moment. And when he took his last breath, it was exactly the moment that had been foreordained in the beginning of time. This is the moment when I'm going to take my last breath. Not a moment before, not a moment later. It wasn't an accident. It didn't have anything to do with the Jews. It didn't have anything to do with the Romans. They were used to get the job done. But I want you to know this morning, God's the one that's in control and nothing changed. God's still in control this morning. He still knows what's going on this morning. And just as much as he was God back there when Christ was on the cross, he's still God this morning. He hasn't changed. He hasn't forgotten what's going on. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows where you are. He knows where I am. And he's watching. And he knows he's in control. And we need to trust that God is still in control. I'm not in control of anything. I'm not in control of this service. My word, we can see that. They sang twice. I thought I was the only person that wanted to sing twice. Uh, I thought that might be strange if I asked them. Uh, but uh, listen, look at the surprise. There's two things under the surprise. Number one, the B part of verse number 44, we see he wants verification. He wants verification. He, it says in verse number 44, And calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. So he wants verification of Christ's death. He says, give me proof that Christ is dead. The centurion that would have been handling this, he calls him in and he said, is he really dead? He wants verification. Here's the second thing that I see in that verse. He wants authorization. He wants authorization. Verse number 45, look at what it says. And when he knew it, and I'm sorry, and when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. So do you see he asked for verification and then he gives the authorization to Joseph. He says, yes, he's dead. I'm authorizing you. Joseph couldn't do it without his permission. You understand that? He had to have Pilate's permission to get... He couldn't just rob the body and take it down off the cross. And so we see that there's verification and there's authorization all under the surprise. I mean, imagine this. He's been on the cross six hours. Say, why is that surprising? Because most of the time it would take several days for somebody to die on the cross. You know, to hang on the cross for six hours would have been a blessing. You say, I don't want to hang on a cross for six hours. I don't want to hang on a cross for six minutes. I'm telling you this morning that six hours was a blessing because most guys would hang up there for a couple of days, they say, Brother Caston, uh, all, all the while uh, draining blood from their body, being in pain, being wrecked with pain. And it would, they would come along and actually, and we see that in the story there, and we're not going to get to it this morning, where he sends them to break the legs of the thieves. That's so that they couldn't pick themselves up anymore and draw breath in. That's what they would do. Their feet would be crossed and they would pick themselves up because if you're hanging from here, everything gets pushed up around your throat area and you would literally begin, you would suffocate. And so they would push themselves up on the cross and breathe in and then they would slump back down and they could hold that a while and then, and they could breathe it back out again and they would do that for a couple of days days until they weren't able to do that anymore, until they just all your strength is gone. Uh, and so imagine that is going on on the cross. And so Pilate says, six hours, there's no way he's dead. He said, tell me whether or not he's dead. And so they send, and sure enough, so Pilate is extremely surprised by this. God's not surprised. Christ said, I'm going to give up the ghost now. It's time for me to handle this business. You'd see if you study out the rest of those verses that they would go along, they would break the, the legs of the thieves because it is the day of preparation. And they were not supposed to uh, leave them there uh, on the cross through the day of preparation. We're not going to get into that. Here's the next thing uh, that I want us to see. Go to John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19 because it's important. John chapter number 19, I want you, we not only saw the characters and the concealment, and we saw the courage, and we've seen a lot of points in between all of that, but here's one I want you to see. And this is where the rubber meets the road for you and I. I want you to see the cost. There's a cost involved in serving Christ. Did you know that? You say, it hasn't cost me anything. Yeah, we know. That's why we're wondering who you're serving. There's a cost involved when it comes to serving Christ. Let's look at the cost together in John chapter number 19, verse number uh, 38. Please look at it with me. Uh, I want you to see, the. here's the first cost, perspiration. 
Mm. Perspiration. Sweat, ladies. I'm just trying to make it nice and I needed something that started with a P. Perspiration. Serving Christ takes perspiration. This is not a joke. And Sunday night, I hit this point already, and so I don't need to spend a lot of time here, but I will hit it and keep running. Uh, look at verse number 38 of John chapter number 19. You say, I don't see perspiration in the Bible. Really? Look at verse number 38, uh, the B part. Uh, it says here, uh, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. And look, he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Verse 39, and there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Only three hours. Now watch. Here we are. He's gotten permission. Let's go, to the, let's go there quickly and let's watch him. He's gotten permission. Now it's, and I'm just, I'm being logical here. He died at three o'clock. Brother Aaron, I don't know that I'm wrong. It's got to be after three o'clock. He's had to go to Pilate, okay? And he's had to get permission to get Christ. That took time. And then we had to get the centurion. And so now we're back and forth. Is it 315? Is it 3? I mean, the day is ebbing on. And so now he says, I've got to get the job done. Why? Watch what he has to do. Before 6 o'clock, here's what has to be done. He's got to get to the cross, get the nails out of Christ's hands, get the nail out of his feet, and take that body. Him and Nicodemus. The Roman soldiers weren't going to help him. John wasn't there. James wasn't there. Mary wasn't there. None of the other, Peter wasn't there. There's no disciples. It's Joseph and Nicodemus to get a grown man. Jesus wasn't a little 50-pound uh, weakling. I mean, it's a grown man, right? He's hanging on the cross that is suspended uh, in air. They have to get up there, get the nails taken out, and get his body down. Then they've got to take that body. They have to, uh, they, they, they would, they're going to wrap it with 100 pounds. Hello? We have a grown man. They're putting now 100 pounds of, uh, of myrrh and aloe on him. Now we've just had, let's say Jesus weighed 150 pounds. Was he 150 pounds, 160 pound man? Let's say he was. You've just added 100 pounds to it. By the way, there's a lot of dispute over that. They say, what, is 100, what was 100 pounds in Bible times? What? 100 pounds in Bible times. Uh, I wish I had a, I, I wish I were a Greek scholar, Brother Mark. Maybe I could figure out what 100 pounds back then was. It was probably 100 pounds. I don't know. I mean, am I wrong in that? Somebody correct me. I read some reports that said 100 pounds was really only 75. Oh, yeah, I could see that. Here, pick up this 100-pound weight for me. Well, that's not 100 pounds. I know it's only 75, but I just wanted to call it a 100-pound weight. You'd look at me and go, are you stupid? I was expecting 100 pounds. If he'd have told me 75, I would have had my wife do it. 100 pounds, 100 pounds to me. Maybe I'm wrong, and the Lord will straighten me out when I get to heaven. 100 pounds. So let's say he weighs an average man, 160. They put 100 pounds on him. That's 260 pounds for two men. It's a body. They've got to wrap it up. They've got to get it in the grave, in the tomb. They have to get it sealed up, roll a stone, and get all of that done in, in two and a half hours. Could you do that? I'm going to tell you what. These two boys were sweating, Brother Nate, because they're also grown men. And they were probably typical Baptists, and so they were probably a little on the svelte side. Svelte. That means they were bigger. They were healthy. They were big boned. I'm trying to be politically correct here because I just don't want to come right out and say those words that you don't want me to say. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe. I don't know. I don't know what they. I don't know what they look like. But there. Here's. A, I mean, get this in your mind. Can you see the two of them rushing around? I mean, imagine me and Brother Aaron were going to try to, you know, take a dead body. And I mean, first of all, how much do you think they knew about dead bodies? Probably not that much. How much do you think they knew about taking somebody off a cross? How much do you think they knew about burying somebody? Now, back then, things were a little bit different. You buried your own family. So maybe they understood that. I'm not, these guys aren't experts 
and wrapping bodies and doing this. So, I mean, man, I can imagine when I see these two, never thought about it, man, sweat has got to be just a pouring off of them because they're going, oh, my word, it's 415, and we haven't even got them down yet, much less got them to the place where we got to get, I mean, we got to get this done. Come on, Nick, man, let's go. Come on, Joe, let's hurry up, man. We got to get the job done. Hey, Christian, serving Christ takes perspiration. It takes perspiration. Hey, When's the last time you were sweaty for the work of the Lord? And I'm not talking about, I mean, yeah, maybe sometimes real sweat. We come down to the church house in the middle of summer, or the middle, and, and the uh, springtime is coming, and we always have a big work day, and we get stuff done. And, and man, some people show up, and a lot of people don't show up. Why? You afraid to get your hands dirty? Well, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know that. Hey, person, and by the way, it's for everybody. Man, I'll come down, throw my jeans on, and I'll work just alongside everybody else. It doesn't make any difference. Hey, that, that, this is about work, man. This thing is work. And, and trying to help people, sometimes you're going to perspire trying to help people. I mean, it takes perspiration. It takes sweat. Because the job has got to get done. You know what's wrong? Got too many sissy Christians. They're sissified. I just have my nails done. I don't want to get them dirty. And I'm talking about the guys. <laughs> you have your legs waxed too, honey? I'm just, but listen, the song fired me up, now I'm going mean. But think about it, man, we got a bunch of sissified men in the church house. You know what? Here's a work day. Here's a work day at the average Baptist church. 35 women and five men. Where's your husband? Oh, he's watching football. Well, is he getting his back waxed? <laughs> Had to say it. <laughs> I mean, come on. What do you mean? Well, he worked all week. Oh, poor little fella. Does he make you cut the grass too? Hey, this takes work, and I'm not talking about work. I mean, this takes work, man. You're going to have to give yourself to the work of the ministry. And you know what? I mean, to build a solid church and to be a solid Christian, it takes perspiration. This ain't, I said it Sunday night. I'll repeat it. This is a battlefield. You're not going to put all that armor on, Brother Mark, and go out in the heat of the battle and be cooled off because you got a helmet and you got a shield and you got a sword. Man, I'd imagine those guys stunk when they stank. However you say it, stank, stunk, stink. Uh, how I, isn't that what Dr. Seuss says it like that? And you'd laugh if it were Dr. Seuss. But I mean, that's how, that, that's, them guys went out to battle. Hey, wearing all that armor is going to cause you to sweat. Hey, being in the battle, I mean, they didn't have a machine gun stand. They had a sword in their hand. And buddy, they were in the battle. That's what this thing is all about. It's about getting in the battle. It's about perspiration. Why don't you just commit yourself to doing the work of Christ and making a difference and getting in there and just jumping in all hogging a biscuit. That's what Dr. Hodge says. But I mean, think about it. When's the last time you sweated for the sweat? I mean, you lathered up for the cause of Christ. And what I mean by that is that you have poured yourself into somebody else. I didn't, we sweat for ourselves a lot. You know, we'll work around the house, man. We'll work up a sweat and we'll do this and we'll do that. And, we'll, and I mean, all kinds of things for ourselves. When's the last time we did it for somebody else? Joseph and Nick aren't doing this for themselves. They've got one cause. And one person in mind, and his name is Christ. And they said, this is going to take us some time. It's going to take us some perspiration. I mean, we've got to get the job done. There is a cost that is involved uh, when it comes to serving Christ. Uh, under this, uh, as we look at uh, the cost, we see it's, there's perspiration. I want you to see uh, in verse number 40 uh, of John chapter number 19, I want you to see the pattern. Look at the pattern with me in verse number 40. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now you say, preacher, why is this important? I'm going to give you something. The Jews did not embalm, they wrapped. The, the Egyptians embalmed. The Jews wrapped. Get that down. They wrapped the body. There was a special way that that was done. You say, what does that have to do with anything? I'll quote what Mr. Morris said. These are long bandages like strips, not a shroud. Do you know what I'm talking about? That's a bunch of hogwash. 
The Catholic Church doesn't have a shroud. There's two, let me give you two things that refute the fact that the Catholic Church ha has the shroud. Number one, how come they won't allow it to be tested? They claim that they'll damage it. I guess if I had something that wasn't real, I wouldn't want anybody to touch it either. Right? Are you with me or do you think that there really is one? Because you saw it on TV. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because the TV told you that. <laughs> Man, we got a confused generation. They, they, believe everything, they believe everything they read on the internet, Brother Mark, because the TV told them that they ought to believe everything on the internet. Well, bonjour. <laughs> you dirty, rotten TV watchers. Now I'm preaching about TV, because you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Listen, there's a pattern here. They don't want anybody to test it because they will find out that it's a fake. Here's the second thing that really does refute uh, uh, this Catholic theology uh, uh, that is out there. And uh, it, the, body, the Bible says two, three times, Matthew 27, 59, Mark 15, 46, and Luke 23, 53, it says wrapped. In John 19 and verse number 40, it says wound. It wasn't laid over him. That's what the shroud was. He was wrapped tightly. They put those, they put them, them spices on him, and that's the way they did that back then, so that the body would not uh, put off quite the odor. At least it wouldn't be as bad. That's why they would use so many. And they would wrap that tightly around them. That's not a shroud. You know what that tells me? That book is always right. Amen. And if we'd start just believing the book and stop, and stop believing some bozo, we could just trust what it says. And it says they wrapped the body of Jesus, not placed a shroud over him that's got the imprint of Jesus on it. Come on. The imprint of Jesus on something? I got the imprint of Jesus on me. It's on my heart. I don't need a shroud to prove that to me. I know what the scripture says that they wrapped the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we see the pattern there. Uh, let, let's quickly look at uh, uh, the place. Let's look at the place. Look with me at verse number 41 and verse number 42, John chapter number 19. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new sepulcher, wherein was never man uh, yet laid. Uh, and so here, I want you to see a couple things about this place. Look at the character of the place. And under the character of the place, let's look at the nature of the place. Uh, Luke chapter, no, and I'm not going to turn there because we don't have time. Luke chapter number 23, verse number 53, here's what you'll find. It says that it was a stone. This was carved out of rock. If you go to Palestine, uh, they say that up and down in that area and in this area, it abounds in the neighborhoods there with tombs that are cut out of solid limestone. Do you know why that's important? Because there's a whole group of people that say that the disciples dug into the back of the tomb and they took out the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Really, they dug through solid limestone? What'd they use? Their hands? Oh, I, I suppose they probably got out some pneumatic hammers. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, while the centurion was out front, they were back there, you know, getting into the rock, because we got to get Christ out of there. And the guy out front, he ain't going to hear any of that. We're all right back here. Everything I'm giving you this morning is saying one thing. Trust the book. God knows what's going on. Man doesn't have a clue. Don't believe that fallacy. They, they snuck into the back. They didn't sneak into the back. There's one thing that's very evident about the tomb, Brother Chris. There was one way in, and there was one way out, and that was through the door. Boy, what a great picture. There's one way to heaven, and it's through the door. That's it. You ain't going to dig in the back door. There is no back door. And so you would see here uh, underneath the place, uh, the, nat uh, the character of the place, uh, uh, the nature. Uh, how about the newness? In Luke, uh, again, uh, 23 and verse number 53, and in John 19 uh, and verse number 41, look at what it says. And in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. He was born, God, watch this. Christ was born in a virgin womb and he was placed in a virgin tomb. Why is that important? 
Because there's also people out there that say that he, they went to the wrong tomb. And it really wasn't, there was somebody else in the tomb. No, the Bible refutes that by saying nobody had ever been there ever. It was brand spanking new. Christ was the only one laid there. The newness had to be. There's a reason for all of that, right? Because we need to show, what are we learning this year? What are we learning? What we what? What we believe. So what are you going to say when somebody comes to you and says, uh, well, it, the disciples came and took them. They dug in the back. I just gave you four scripture verses that you can take them to and say, really, they dug, th they dug, through, they dug through a stone? How in the world could they have done that? Well, I mean, there was probably uh, some other bodies in there. There's some other things going on in there. And, and maybe they were just confused about the place. No, the Bible says that it was a new tomb. Uh, I can show you the scripture verse on that too. See, you can refute the things that people say to you just by using the Bible. The scripture uh, is always going to be right. And so we see the character of the place. We see the nature. Uh, we see the newness. Now look at the cultivation of the place and, and the A part of verse number 41. Now there is, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. It was a garden. I mean, uh, man, there is so much significance to everything that's going on here. And I never put it all together till I began to study it. But I mean, I just gave you. He's born in a virgin womb. He is laid in a virgin tomb. And now watch this. In the place he was crucified, so we realize it's close, there's a garden there. And I am out of time. We're never going to make it. But look it, there's a garden there. Does that remind you of something? Think about back in Genesis. Guess what was... Guess what seed was sown in that garden? The seed of sin was sown in a garden several thousand years before this. And now, brother, brother Nate, we've got another garden and another seed's about to be planted. And it's called the seed of redemption. In a garden was the seed of sin sown over here, but now all of a sudden we fast forward through the ages and we come forward to a place and we come forward to another garden and we find here that the first Adam gave us sin, but the second Adam is going to give us sanctification. The first Adam uh, would give us a road to hell, but the second Adam would give us righteousness. I mean, man, that's good stuff right there. Uh, you're, it's better than you're letting on right now. I promise you, what Adam did back here in a garden, Christ took care of in a garden right here. He said, just lay my body right there because I'm the second Adam and I'm not going to be here very long. That's why the Bible says, in a garden. Man, that's, that's powerful. Because Christ is about to undo what Adam messed up back there. He had to. He had to. So he's about to uh, sow another seed here in this garden. So we see the cultivation. We see the close, closeness of it. And I already gave that to you uh, to fulfill uh, and there's a reason that it's close, because he needed to fulfill three days and three nights. I'll just give it to you. Three days and three nights does not equate to dying on Friday and rising on Sunday morning. Again, just as much as I'm not a scholar in a lot of areas, I'm not real strong in math, but Friday night to Sunday morning have never equaled three days and three nights in my math. Or else I went to a bad school. Any more than 100 pounds is really 75. I mean, whoever, whoever came up with all of these ideas must have struggled, Brother Caston, with math. Well, 100 is really only 75, and 3 is really only 1 and a half. Oh, well, my mother was stupid. My teacher was stupid. My principal was stupid. Mr. Einstein was an idiot. Yeah, I could see that. I could see how millions of people are really dumb because one guy said three days and three nights was Friday to Sunday morning. I could see that. Well, 100 pounds is really only 75 or 50 or whatever number you want to come up. I mean, <laughs> it gets me so frustrated. Bible correctors trying to read more into it. And I've read a lot of articles, and, and, I, and, I, I, and listen, I'm not going to argue it, and, and it's not something that's arguable about the three days, the three nights, and how the Jews equated the days, and so on and so forth, and blah, blah, blah. I believe Christ was in the grave.
for three days and three nights, and he arose on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday morning early before the light. Well, what, if he was three days and three nights, when would he have needed to go into the tomb? Thursday? Does that make sense? And so we don't really believe in Good Friday. I'm sorry. Are we going to have a Good Friday service? Every Friday is a Good Friday here at the Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, but we see the closeness of it because he needs to be three days and three nights, and they've got to get the job done because at 6 o'clock, you have to understand the Jewish calendar, the Jewish time, a new day is about to begin. Their day starts at 6 p.m., okay? Not like our day does, a uh, difference in, in time. And so now man is again being used by God to get done what God has foreordained. Look with me quickly too at the prompting, at the prompting of these two. So here we have two people. They've been hiding until the cross. But the prompting that's gotten them out of that was the cross. I don't need to re-preach the message I preached on Wednesday night. But what's prompting you this morning? When is the last time that you thought about Christ on the cross and it prompted you to do something like these two disciples did? There are some people in this room right now and you're a hidden, you're a secret disciple and nobody knows that you're a Christian. I don't care if you tell people or not. I'm saying you don't act like, you don't live like it, you don't do anything for the cause of Christ. You're a Christian and that's in name only. When the Christians were first called uh, Christians in Antioch, that had nothing to do uh, with them. It had everything to do with the way that they acted and they acted like Christ and that's why they call them Christians. To be a Christian is to act like Christ. And I dare say that most of us are a long ways from that on a daily basis. Anybody here been a Christian seven days this week? And all of our hands would go up, and then I'd say to you, have you been Christ-like for seven days, 24 hours a day? And I guarantee you, your hand would go down. Being a Christian means to be Christ-like. And here we have two secret disciples, and one, or once a secret and one suspected disciple. But what's prompted them to come out of the woodwork is the fact that they saw the Savior, and they said, something's got to be done. Well, we need, we need to get back to the place where we see the Savior. And we need to make a difference in this world. So we see the prompting that gets them out. And I am out of time. Glad that they, that they uh, fixed the clock. There's a price that they're going to have to pay. And uh, I have about five points underneath that. I'm not going to give them all to you, but I do want to give one to you. Here's a price. I want you to think about this. Here's a price. If you are a Bible student at all, at, at all you'll understand that Passover had some requirements on the person that was going to partake of Passover. Did you know that? One of those was that you couldn't touch a dead body. Did you know that? If you were going to partake of the Passover meal with your family, so I'm going to sit down with my family, and we're all going to get together because that's what they do at Passover. Families get together. The Jews got it right. In case you're wondering, boy, they get together, and I mean, this is a family function. And I mean, they enjoy the company one of another. They read scripture, and they do all these things. So we're going to get together as a family function. We're going to go over uh, to the house, and, and you're going to cook the Passover meal, and the whole family's going to come. But now, wait a minute. Have you been near a dead body? What have you been doing? Where have you been? They had to be completely pure. And guess what? There is a price sometimes that comes with serving Christ. And one of those is now both of these men who would have been part of the Passover meal are now polluted. If you study the Bible, you go back to the book of Leviticus and here's what you'll find. There were some men that had touched a dead body and they came to Moses. Some came to Moses and said, it's Passover and these men have touched the dead body. What do we do with them? Moses said, let's go to the Lord and ask him. Here's what the Lord said. They can partake of the Passover in 30 days. I never knew that. Matter of fact, I had to read the scripture because I'm not real smart, Brother John, five times. And I thought, everybody that told me that was wrong. These men weren't polluted because it says in the Bible that uh, they, come to, they come to Moses and, and, and Moses goes to God and God says, yeah, they can partake of the Passover. And I'm reading it and reading it and reading it and it's not sinking in that it says in there two different months. There's two separate months in the book of Leviticus. When you read the first Passover, it is the first, as the 14th day of the month of Nisan, I think I'm correct on that, or something like that. Uh, and then he says, if they've been near a dead body, they can have the Passover 
in the second month, they can't go and be with the family. They're now segregated. They're now out. They're not a part of the celebration anymore. But they said, that's all right, because we want to take care of Christ. I don't think that you fully understand the ramifications of that. Because you don't really care whether or not we go to family functions. Sometimes we say, well, it ain't no big deal. No, Passover is a big deal to the Jews. A big deal. Just ask them, even today. Back then, way bigger than it is now. And they said, we'll do this. You know, there's going to be a cost. There's going to be a price for serving Christ. Our hands are going to get dirty. And sometimes because of the things that we're going to do, some people aren't going to want to be around us. But you know what? Joe and Nick said, that's all right. That's all right. He's worth it. Getting him into that grip, it's worth it. I wish we had the rest of the time to look at this. And I, I can't give it to you tonight because we're going to look at something else. But I'm going to close with this. There's some, here's where we're going to end up at. They're going to get him down. They're going to place him in the tomb. They're going to seal that thing up. But there's something very important that, again, we go back to the Bible and we realize the Bible is always true. You would find that there is some perceiving that's going to go on. The perceiving is by the women. There is two women that follow Joseph and Nicodemus to the grave. <laughs> kind of funny. Nothing much has changed. When we go to the graveside, isn't it funny how so many people go, they don't go to the graveside service, you know, they'll come to a funeral, but they won't go. Nothing was different back in the Bible, Brother Caston. We have Joseph, we have Nicodemus, and we have two women. That's all that went to the graveside. But here's what it says about those two women. It says that they watched where they laid them, how they laid them. And if you study it, and I did, if you study it out, it means that they, they laid like, didn't miss anything. They went in. They watched how his body was laid. They watched how he was wrapped. They watched every single thing that Joseph and Nicodemus did until they rolled the stone, rolled the stone in front of that door. They didn't miss one thing, Brother Caston, because they were coming back and they were going to take care of Christ after the Passover, after the Sabbath. They were preparing spices. They were going to roll that away and they were going to properly prepare his body there for the burial. Why is that? Because they did not believe. If you study the Bible, you'll find nobody believed he was going to rise from the dead. Nobody. Not, not the disciples. Not, not those women. They're watching this because they don't believe. And again, it refutes the fact that many say Mary went to the wrong tomb. Mm -mm. You study the Bible out and you'll find that she watched every single thing that they did and exactly where they... She wasn't messed up. She didn't go to the wrong place. She knew exactly where she was going. See, this thing about the resurrection... Why I'm spending a whole month preaching about what we believe when it comes to the resurrection? Because it's foundational. Because what do you have without it? You've got a dead Savior. You've got a lying Bible. You've got a bunch of liars that said he really rose from the dead and he really didn't because they're the ones that stole his body. Not so. Not so. This stain is commonly reported, right? Isn't that what the Bible said? This stain is commonly reported among the Jews because they said, go and say that his disciples stole him away at night. Not so. His body was not there. I'm going to pray. Ask yourself this question. What would you do if you were them? You're Joseph and Nicodemus. What would you do? Oh, I don't want to dirty myself. I don't want to get sweaty. I don't want to get dirty. He'll be all right up there. How many times do we leave him there? Because we just don't care. Because we just don't want to do anything about it. Because we don't want to pay the price to serve Christ. Young person, middle-aged person, teenager, servant, lay person, teacher. Servant Christ costs something. And I, and, I, and I wish more people would be willing to pay that price and stop playing around. It does. It's going to cost you something. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed this morning. Wish I could have made it through the whole message, but I believe the Lord knows exactly how far we need to go. What have you done with Christ? What shall we do with this man that is called Christ? I think that's what Pilate said. 
And maybe you're here this morning, there's never been a time in your life when you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. By the way, they're going to lay him in a grave, and that's where we've left him, but he's no longer there. I never want to leave him in the grave, because he did come out. We heard that in the song. He came out. I don't need to tell you that next Sunday. I'll tell you it this Sunday. He didn't stay there for long. Three days later, and he, nobody rolled back the stone. He was already gone. They rolled back the stone so that they could get in and see that he was gone. But he's, he's out of the grave. And maybe you've never trusted him as your personal Savior. You'd say, Preacher, I don't even know if I'd go to heaven right now. Preacher, pray for me. Anybody like that in this room? Where would you spend an eternity? What have you done with Christ? He went to that cross for you and for me. Second question, Preacher, just pray for me. The Holy Spirit did move across my heart this morning in the service. I see that hands going up all over. Hands going up all over, all over. Thank you. Thank you. Father, as we come before you, I pray that Lord, the whole room, we need to be willing to pay the, pay the price, pay the cost, the perspiration. Lord, there's a cost when it comes to serving Christ. I don't want to make it something that it is not. There is. And anybody that's served Christ for any length, amount, or any, any length of time has realized there is a cost. Sometimes it's a high cost. Sometimes it's family. Thinks you're nuts, doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Sometimes it's friends. Why are we so wrapped up and worried about what everybody else thinks about us? I didn't say we have to be nuts and crazy, but serving Christ does cost something. Hey, it may cost us a, a career because we just want to follow you and your precepts and go to the mission field or do something for the cause of Christ. It may cost us the big house, the nice cars. I'm sure. Lord, those that give those things up on earth, I believe will be greatly rewarded in heaven because you're keeping score there. And you're keeping the books, and you know. Please help every hand that's gone up. Let's all stand. Heads bowed and eyes are closed. Piano's playing. Altar is open. Come do business.